morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the Creative New Tensions podcast. This is a knit, spin, crochet, weave, sew, quilt, kind of really a general craftiness podcast. My name is Tanya, and I'm coming to you from New York City, where I live with my husband and our three fur children, who, if you guys have pets, you're probably pretty aware they may, they may not show up. They really, they have run out of the house, and they do whatever they want, so... <laughs> I really appreciate you guys joining us today for our inaugural episode. I know there are so many fabulous podcasts out there, video, audio, and it's, I'm I'm really grateful that you've taken the opportunity to try out yet another one. Um, I pretty much came to knitting podcasts in particular after years of just enjoying podcasts in general. So I was a big fan of various yoga podcasts and you know, NPR podcasts and things like that. And then one day someone had mentioned knitting podcasts to me and I was like, wait, that's a thing? Like people actually do that. And, you know, it popped onto iTunes and I was really amazed at what I found. And so I started following one knitting podcast and one turned into two and two turned into 20 and 20 turned into probably closer to 50. And, you know, there are a lot more podcasts out there even now. So that number has continued kind of to increase over time. And so I kind of wanted to start my own knitting podcast as so many others have to become a bigger part of the knitting community that we all know and love. But also because I think I, 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 I was originally kind of really struggling with the idea that I might not bring anything new to the table. I might just be just another knitting podcast, you know, just another person knitting the same kind of projects or the same kind of yarns or, things like that. And I wouldn't really bring anything that would make my podcast different or worthwhile compared to the other ones that I know and love and are obviously 10 times more established than someone starting something on a Sunday afternoon would be. And then I kind of passed it around to a few different people. I extensively have been debating the idea for months with my husband and I've talked about it with a lot of my friends and everyone kind of has said the same thing, and that's that we all bring our own individual slant to knitting, whether it's the yarns we've chosen or the modifications we make or the projects that we choose or even something as simple as, you know, taking a pattern and I might like to use it on paper and that might change the way that I knit it as opposed to somebody who might prefer to do it digitally. And that might change some of the different aspects that they're willing to do. You know, I might not bring along the fifth page that has only a single row on it. And so I might change that or, you know, we all bring our own something to the table. And I think what kind of makes me in particular a little bit different is you, it's something you might have noticed is I've got a, I'm a bit of a plus size knitter. And so when I'm looking at knitting patterns, I'm not just looking at, hmm, do I like this pattern? Would I like working this pattern? Would this pattern work into the handmade wardrobe that I'm trying to create? But also I'm looking at, you know, is this flatter into my shape? Because I got a whole lot of shape. Or can I make this flatter into my shape? What modifications, you know, bust short rows or darts or hip modifications or, you know, just general changes to different shapes in cardigans or sweaters or things like that, or even shawls that will make it flattering for me. And it's definitely a struggle that I have in a lot of patterns, but it's knitting. It's so much fun, you know, when it really comes down to it. And so, yes, I know some of you out there are probably thinking, oh, you're a female knitter. You have a podcast. Let me guess. You knit shawls. And, well, I do. (laughs) Actually, in today's episode, I have a bunch of finished objects that I finished in the last week or two. And they're all shawls for the most part. (laughs) But my big thing as... I alluded to a little bit a couple of seconds ago is I love knitting sweaters. I'm one of those people who tries to knit at least, you know, 12 to 15 sweaters a year. And it's really important to me that they are things that I love so that I'm using yarns that I enjoy wearing as well as working with. And that there are things that will incorporate well into my wardrobe in terms of being flattering and fit the lifestyle that I have. You know, I do work in an office uh, five days a week and I do have a you know a lot of various knitting groups I'm a part of and I do like to try and get out and go to zoos and various things as well as you know the occasional more fancy event and all of those things require clothing I know it's a novel idea we can't just go naked wherever we want and <laughs> I like to make sure that the things that I'm crafting whether it's sewing or knitting or 
you know, even something as simple as weaving a scarf fit that life, not just for, you know, a specific event, but for the life that I'm trying to create for myself. And so it's definitely a challenge. And I'm excited to kind of bring you guys through that journey as I work on different projects and make different modifications and hopefully can help some of you make different modifications and different changes to enjoy the garments and the accessories that you're making that much more. Um, I first got into knitting when I was a kid because my aunt was trying to teach me at the same time she was trying to teach her seven-year-old daughter. And I was, you know, I was maybe 11 or 12 or something like that. And I made really, really bad Swiss cheese because <laughs> there were so many drop stitches on the needles. There was a lot of knit two together. I mean, you know how when you make a mistake and sometimes people say either, oh, you're trying to be artistic or you're just utilizing a knitting technique that you had no idea about yet. Yeah, that's not what was going on here. It was just a hot, hot mess. And I'd really, I'd kind of thrown my hands up in the air. I'd always been able to crochet. And so I just kind of used that opportunity watching my seven-year-old cousin totally get knitting and make like this awesome stuff knit fabric. I looked at it and I went, yeah, knitting's not for me. I'm never going to be a knitter. And I continued to crochet and I would continue to crochet well into my 20s and onward. And knitting kind of wasn't a part of my craftiness until my husband, well, my now husband and I were living in Cincinnati close to his um, relatives and his sister would come down and visit. And she had recently picked up the knitting bug from a couple of her friends. And she, she was sure I knew how to do the pearl stitch. And so I didn't. <laughs> But, you know, I had to keep up appearances and try and be this awesome crafty person um, trying to impress my teenage sister-in-law. <laughs> and so I learned how to do the pearl stitch and I found out that I could kind of do the knit stitch and started trying to really progress through different knitting patterns and things and really tr became a knitter by accident as a result of that circumstance. And so... Getting into more of the things that I do now was really an accident. Um, and it kind of accumulated or was kind of, it was kind of all brought to a head when we had our first yarn crawl here in New York City. And I picked up a couple issues of Knitwear Magazine. And the premiere issue had this beautiful um, cabled caplet and it was in this deep red color. And I was in love with it and I was totally obsessed with making it. And so I was scouring all the pages of all the patterns and all the copies of the magazine that I had, trying to like build up my pattern reading skills so that I could do that one. And I came across the Froth Mobius. And it was this lace weight, beautiful kind of shroud, uh, just like an all over wrap that you could wear in a thousand different ways. And I was like, oh, I really want to make that. I could totally, that looks a thousand times simpler than trying to figure out how to do cables. Let me just go ahead and do this. Well, I ran into a couple problems immediately. And the first was that I was trying to use a really, really chunky, thick DK yarn that was single plied for something that called for a thick plied lace weight yarn. I didn't really know any better at that point. So <laughs> I didn't even know that that was a limitation I was having until I got into the very first instruction and it had me do a cast on and I was good. I could understand the cast on. But then it said knit one front and back. And I was like, okay, sure. Let me flip to the back of the magazine and figure out how I would do a knit one front and back. And it said stick the needle in through the front loop as if to knit and then do basically do the same thing in the back loop. And I got so confused because I never put my needle in the back loop. I was always I was always trained as a knitter who used everything. I would knit and I would purl out of the back loop. And so the instructions threw me for a loop. And I asked my husband, hey, you're normally good with kind of interpreting things. Can you read this pattern and tell me if you could help me figure it out? And long story short, a couple of weeks later, we both took a knitting class together where they tried to instruct me out of knitting through the back loop. And he learned all the knitting skills that he has today. And my husband does knitwear design and all of those kind of fun things. And actually has a podcast of his own. But he really got me more into knitting just because he was in knitting. And so it became a part of our lives together. You know, we have a lot of knit groups that we go together and knitting events and things like that. But it's really kind of funny how all of that came together just because I couldn't figure out a relatively simple instruction. 
And so between that and between trying to impress my now sister-in-law, knitting kind of came really haphazardly into my life, but I'm so glad that it did because it's a huge part of my life. You know, we have a tiny New York City apartment and we have a walk-in closet in our bedroom that as soon as we walked in when we were seeing the apartment with our broker, I went, it's a yarn closet. And once we moved in, not really that sad to say that's exactly what it turned out to be. There's more yarn in that closet. Maybe one of these episodes I'll do a tour. Um, It's still a walk-in closet, so it's not going to take very long. But (laughs) it's really kind of funny that that's what we use it for. You know, we have all of these beautiful yarns. And I think that's one of the things that I also kind of contribute interesting or different to the podcasting community. And that's that I have a whole lot of stash. And people say that, and I look at their kind of posts on forums, and I'm always like, oh, that's cute, because my stash is out of control. There's so much of it, and it feels like it's never ending, and I really need to knit it down. And so I'm trying to do somewhat of a cold turkey kind of thing, where I'm using 2016 to try and knit from my stash. Obviously, I purchased the yarn in the first place because I love the yarn, and I want to use it. But I feel like I probably want to use it for more than pretty decoration in the walk-in closet. And so I'm hoping that there's not going to be a lot of stash enhancement, um, kind of retail therapy on this podcast. Um, (laughs) I say that kind of trepidatiously because I know there probably still will be, but I really do want to kind of try and keep that to a limit um, with a couple of exceptions. I am a part of a fiber of the month club from Nerd Girl Yarn, and so every month um, there's a different braid of fiber that I'm really excited to show you guys. Um, One of the things I love about that club is that, you know, one month I might get milk fiber, and another month I might get, you know, a BFL soap blend, and really going through what the different qualities of these yarns are, as well as the gorgeous colors that Nerd Girl provides. Um, I'm really interested in kind of taking that journey. I'm also a part of a Nerd Girl monthly club inspired by Doctor Who. And so um, three of the yarns that I have to show you guys today are the last three months of the club. And I will not be dropping out of that club. (laughs) So there'll be a monthly stash enhancement from that. But outside of that, I don't want to keep buying. These are all kind of prepaid things. These are things that um, I don't really consider retail therapy, I just consider kind of a slow, relatively acceptable stash enhancement. Really, I'm just trying to make lives for myself and justify it. But yeah, outside of those, I really want to kind of try and keep the enhancement to the minimum. And so I have a lot of things that I kind of want to show you guys today. And I have a lot of things I want to talk about in future episodes. So let's kind of get started with the yarny things, right? So speaking of the Nerd Girl um, Doctor Who Club, It is a three-month club run, and so we recently just finished out the early winter 2016 club, and I wanted to share all three of the yarns with you guys, because typically what the Yarn Dyer Krista does is she tries to come up with three Doctor Who-inspired colorways that are all kind of similar to one another, not necessarily based around a theme, but that have some kind of continuity between them, and this particular run of the club has been my definite favorite and so all three of these are on her bounce and stomp base which is a uh, four ply 75% superwash merino 25% nylon blend of seven hundred of 460 yards and so the first one in the club is I'll look at the sky and so this is a colorway inspired by Donna's grandfather um, and as you can see This camera will never do justice to some of the variation in this yarn. It has beautiful kind of reds, slightly pink speckles. It has tans. It has some beautiful kind of browns in there. Um, I don't think knitting this up would be self-striping at any means, but, oh, I kind of got this in the mail when I was sick over the Christmas break, and... I don't know what it's going to be. And you're going to hear me say that a lot when anything new kind of comes in. I don't know what it's going to be, but I know looking at it, this is going to be something beautiful. Like, there's just no way around it. And so this was the first month. This 
is a colorway inspired by Davros. And for those of you who aren't necessarily huge fans of the Doctor Who mythos, Davros is kind of one of the creators of one of the big baddies on the show over the years. But you can see this colorway is kind of grays and light browns and beautiful blue kind of sections like you can see here. Oh, I love that blue. But the colors all kind of mesh together into, really, it's, it's a kind of more muted colorway. A lot of the Nerd Girl colorways, as you'll definitely see with the third one in this club, um, they tend to be a little bit more vibrant, a little bit more variegated. This one's definitely a little bit more mild, but oh, I love that. I mean, I could totally see this making a beautiful kind of all-over shawl. Um, maybe something useful in kind of a waiting for rain pattern or, you know, even a nice kind of textured sweater because it's got that nice little variegation, a slip stitch pattern would even probably work pretty nicely with it. But it's, again, I don't, I don't know what it's going to be when it grows up. But the third month, this one is inspired by Osgood. And I definitely, I, I know what this is going to be. But just to kind of show you guys, it's, this one's going to be a lot harder to show because there are all these really fine speckles throughout the yarn. And there's obviously these reds. There are these brown sections, this almost purpley pink. There are these whites and there are these yellow sections. And that's a pretty good picture of kind of what some of these speckles in here look like. But it's so heavily speckled. And if you kind of take the full skein you can kind of see this will make some beautiful kind of self-striping almost going on depending on the pattern and so I know for me this is going to be an across the pond by Mina Phillips this is going to be the body of the shawl that beautiful kind of textured slip stitch pattern that she has and this yarn which is also a Nerd Girl yarn um, called Conspiracy in the color Windu. There's about 20% bamboo in here. This is going to be the edging or the kind of border. And you can kind of see these will work pretty nicely together. And so that's kind of the closest thing we have to acquisitions right now, guys. I've done a pretty good job of not buying stuff. And I really need to keep that up because... Thankfully, this stack over here is mostly stash yarn, but if I don't start using the stash yarn, I'm kind of going to be that woman living with the cats inside a giant pile of wool. So let's go through some of those finished objects, shall we? <clears throat> I want to start with a finished object that I finished a little bit earlier in the month. Um, it is, today's date is February 28th, which typically would be the last day of February, but since we're in a leap year, tomorrow's February 29th, and it gives us one more day for the month. And so this shawl was finished, um, maybe about a week and a half, two weeks ago, and this is the Highland Peak Shawl, also by Mina Phillips. And you, as you can see, it is gorgeous stripes of color with this lace border. And it's just kind of, oh, it's just all over good and squishy. And as you can see, as I'm having a little bit of trouble trying to show it to you, it is huge. This thing is absolutely ginormous. It's worked out of, I used what was actually called from the pattern, which is Malabrigo Worsted. And this was all from Stash. But what was kind of funny is the whole time I was working this shawl, the garter section's you know, it's just back and forth, back and forth. It's a very kind of mindless, enjoyable, comfort kind of knit. But here, if you look at just these two colors, I affectionately referred to this shawl as I was working it as the peas and carrots shawl. Because that's all I could think of. Adding in the bright orange for the border definitely kind of changed that appearance. But yes, yeah, as, as I was working through this shawl, I really wasn't I like the pattern, I like the idea of the pattern, but I spent the majority of the time wishing, ah, oh, 
I really wish we picked something that was a little bit less peas and carry. But like I said, now that it's kind of got this border on it, I'm so much more in love with it. And again, this was Malabrigo Worsted that I've had in my stash since maybe 2011. And I love wearing this thing. This thing is so huge. Um, the one thing that I would caution anybody who decides to do this pattern <clears throat> in the Malabrigo Worsted is when I wear it, I tend to kind of just wear it over my shoulders um, pretty loosely or with a shawl pin. Because it's single plied, I don't necessarily want to kind of like knot it up or tie it around my neck like kerchief style or anything like that because I've worked a couple of projects in Malabrigo Worsted and when you do that, I've had a lot of significant issues with pilling. So, so yeah, to kind of avoid some of those pilling issues, I tend to just kind of, you know, drape it over like this. And I mean, to say it is so warm. It is so cozy. It is so comfortable. If you haven't made one of these and you're kind of trying to debate between the fingering weight and the worsted weight, I really do recommend the worsted weight. I will probably at some point, I've got more than enough fingering to clothe kind of most third world countries. But I think at some point I make I might make another worsted weight version, but I'm pretty sure I'll end up making a fingering weight version as well. And actually, speaking of both Mil Mina Phillips and Nerd Curl Yarns, I have another finished object from her, which is the Across the Pond Shawl. And this is worked in Nerd Girl Yarns in the Astral Base in the super massive black hole colorway. And you'll notice there are still some ends on it, so let's not be too critical of that, but also I blocked it very asymmetrically so here you can see the beautiful kind of textured colorway and I definitely am blocking it I pulled it out a little bit more than it needed to be I like the way it looks in this colorway but I will be definitely when I do the second one in that Osgood yarn I plan to kind of keep this more cinched together more kind of just not necessarily tight, but less strained down the blocking because it's definitely a little bit overblocked as you can see. And then I decided to do the border in the same colorway for this one, mostly because I was at a friend's house and I didn't have any extra yarn on me to work the border. And I was really being wishy-washy about it anyway. I didn't know if I wanted to use a lighter color or a variegated color or I had absolutely no idea. <laughs> and so I just kind of decided to finish the shawl with the border in the same colorway. And again, you can see how poorly blocked this kind of is. But that's a pretty good example of the overall sizing of it. I had done the smaller of the two versions in the pattern. And so I think for me that kind of, I do like larger shawls, but I was definitely at a point with this where I wanted to work on something new. And I wasn't in love with this color with this project. And so I think that's why in my mind I'll be making the other one in this. Um, just because I love the pattern. It is simple to follow and it is so pretty. I mean, Mina's version in the main pattern is just absolutely stunning. But as I was kind of working it in this colorway, I, I just wasn't in love with this yarn um, as much as... I could be with this particular shawl pattern. And I, I feel like that happens to all of us, right? Like at some point you're working on a pattern and you love the pattern and you love the yarn, but you wish they weren't together in the same project or I don't know. Is that maybe just something that happens to me every once in a while? I'm not sure. Let's hope not because it happens pretty frequently to me. I have a Another project over here that I'm not going to show you. It's already predestined for the frog bond, but it's a beautiful yarn and I love the yarn and I love the pattern, but they're not friends together. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, that's, I'll probably give that shawl away as a gift. There are a couple of people I know who love that, both that colorway and that pattern. And so it's a really natural fit for them. But it's not a natural fit for me. And so probably once I make the second one, I'll give that one away. My third finished object is actually a test knit that I did for Kristen of Volvine yarn. It is her upcoming lace 
shawl pattern. Um, and I am absolutely 100% obsessed with this thing. So it starts with a kind of simple eyelet mesh. It's got a good texture to it. And then it kind of goes in a basic triangular shape until you get to this bottom border. And oh, there's a little bit of lace before you do the applied border. But there's also all of these stunning beads that you can start to kind of see in a row here and here. And then, of course, there's the applied lace border. And oh my gosh, working on this, I worked on this out of Kristen's Narwhal base in the Deep Calm colorway, or Dead Calm colorway, rather. It was such a delight to me. <laughs> this was the first time I've ever done beads in my knitting, so for me it was a pretty major element. Um, I'm not sure how well any lighting would pick up the beads because I decided to do a very dark green kind of bead up against this. And so it doesn't pop as much as it kind of could have if I chose a different bead color. But to me, this was a very deep sea, kind of sea inspired colorway. And I wanted that little touch of something a little bit more green in here. And so I do know Kristen's releasing this um, actually this week. So if you guys haven't checked out the pattern or if you haven't been eyeing it on the Yarngasm podcast, I highly recommend you jump in and do it. This is definitely one of those shawls that looks so much more complicated than it is. I found that working on the kind of mesh border, it was definitely something I can do on the subway. It was a kind of commuting knit for me. It was so just kind of basic and mindless to a certain extent. And as you can see, it's, you know, it's a good bulk of the body of the shawl. And it only took me a couple of days to do that, but... As soon as I kind of got to that part, obviously you end up with a lot more stitches being a lace shawl at that point, but I, I was so invested by that point that the border and this little lace pattern before you get into the border took almost no time at all for me. It was just kind of maybe a couple of more nights and voila, I had, that's Molly, that loud noise that you kind of just heard. You get used to it when you live here. But <laughs> back to the shawl, um, I, I just really, I was so in love with this that I think I finished it even faster than I anticipated because I just, I mean, I, I just love this thing. Sorry, we kind of took a cut there for a second as I got in the microphone all tangled up in this beautiful shawl, but. Yeah, I mean, this is definitely one of those patterns that you can see wearing a thousand different places. I had a friend of mine come over and she was mentioning how, you know, you could probably wear it over a fancy dress. I don't really have a lot of those or reasons to wear fancy dresses, but I totally could. I've actually been wearing it to work more frequently than not. Um, so there's that. And like I said, it's absolutely beautiful and it's so much fun to work on. I really struggle being a little bit of a faster knitter and finding patterns that I really enjoy working on. A lot of times patterns can feel a little bit kind of like, okay, well, let's just get this done. And this one, this one definitely did it. And I was really excited about that. But so that's all I really have today for you guys in terms of finished objects. But I, de I do have a couple of different works in progress as well as needle adjacent kind of projects that I, I was really excited to show you guys. And so my first kind of work in progress is this giant bag of fluff here. This is a loop fiber spontaneous, spontaneous spinning cloud. Um, and this one is in the plum wine colorway. When I first started with it, it was approximately four ounces. And you can see the information here. It is a bamboo or tensile and wool blend. And I feel like this is the spinning that goes on forever. I'm not that experienced of a spinner. And so a lot of my projects take, you know, this is only four ounces that I'm complaining about over here. And I know for a lot of you spinners out there, four ounces, you're like, whatever, that's a weekend sitting. But for me, this is still so much fiber. This is still so much spinning. I, I feel really overwhelmed by it. And 
one of the things that I really do like to do with my spinning is I tend to spin a little bit on the thinner side. And so my goal for this was spinning a kind of light, light fingering weight and plying it as a two ply together to make a fingering weight yarn, which I've done with about maybe about an ounce, ounce and a half of this. Um, it is not the best plying job I've ever seen anyone do. It's also not the best um, removal of yarn from a nitty naughty that I've ever seen anyone do. All in all, it's kind of a, uh, well, we're going to go with calling it a beginner's attempt because that's pretty much what it is. Um, it actually, what's really weird about this, or at least to me, is I've done a lot of spindle plied yarns as well as just a lot of stuff on the spindle. Um, and I've never been one to really like 100% balanced yarns, but let me see if I can get this to show you guys what I'm talking about. This is so absurdly balanced. <laughs> there is absolutely no kind of pullback on itself. And I don't, I don't know if that's entirely undesirable, I guess, in the yarn. Um, I've watched a couple of videos with um, the woman who had wrote the Respect the Spindle book. And she had suggested that you don't really want a plot applied yarn to have a, an entirely relaxed balance to it but I feel like this is too much because even as you can see I'm kind of skeining it right now it doesn't it doesn't really want to be a skein it wants to be this sad little limp thing and so I think that's really what's been holding me back from get getting to the rest of this you know I mean it is really pretty and it's something, I love the idea of spinning and I want to spin more, but it still really feels like a lot to me. And so I guess if you guys have any tips for newer spinners to start spinning larger amounts and not want to kill themselves, kind of shoot them my way <laughs> because I can use any suggestions because I've, I've, guys, I've been working on this for far too long. I mean, I'm used to my knitting projects. I can generally knit like two sweaters in a month which I knew to a lot of people seems absolutely absurd and we'll get into that some other time but <clears throat> I have been working on this for two two and a half months and I really am almost at that point where like I put it away I hide it on our on one of the higher shelves of our bookshelf and I almost pretend like it's not there because I can't see it <clears throat> because it's definitely it, it's not so much that it's intimidating it's just that I don't feel like I really excel at it, and so I don't necessarily want to go back to it every day, even though it's been one of my um, kind of Spanier crap for 20 things. But yeah, it's just, it's, it's less intimidating to me, more frustrating, if that makes sense. And so any help that anyone can kind of give me in actually working on that, I'd really appreciate it. Um, our next kind of work in progress is actually an almost finished work. And please forgive me as I look down. I'm trying to find the picture of it in a magazine so I can show you guys what it's going to look like because I made some significant modifications to the pattern. But I'm working on this. This is the Rocks Burrow Pullover. It is design, designed by Courtney Kelly of the Fiber Company Distribution. And it is from this issue of Knitsy Magazine, which is definitely one of my favorites that I have. It is the spring 2012 issue, and it's the one that features the designer showcase with Mercedes um, Tarasovich uh, Clark, who's also the author of Brio Chic, and I love a lot of her design aesthetics, so this has always been <clears throat> definitely a favorite issue of mine, but the Roxborough pullover came to me and again guys I'm sorry I'm looking and trying to flip through as I'm talking to you but it came to me kind of by accident I had purchased a bunch of yarn in four different colorways of fingering weight yarn from nerd girl yarns for a test knit and I could not get gauge I could not get close to gauge when I say I couldn't get close to gauge I mean gauge and I were like miles apart from one another and we were never, ever going to see one another again. 
Like I was like easily like six inches <laughs> per four inches off and or rather six stitches per four inches off. And so I had to abandon the test knit, but in my attempts to kind of like seriously learn to stash down, I had to use this yarn. I had to use it for something. And I had kind of showed earlier, um, this is a portion of it. This is the Nerd Girl Conspiracy. The deep purple is the Windu colorway. Um, there's a light gray in here that you'll see in a couple seconds. It's the Don't Blink colorway inspired by Doctor Who. There's Faraday, which is a coppery kind of gorgeous brown copper golden colorway. And there's also uh, Jenny Jenny Jenny, which is another inspired Doctor Who colorway in a light purple. Now, this is a dolman cardigan, so typically, it, or the way that it's worked in the pattern is that you do the ribbing in the round and then you work your way up, doing increases kind of like at a giant funnel. And since there's no sleeves, you kind of stop when you get to the top point of the funnel and divide working the front and the back separately. And then you kind of three needle bind off the shoulders and then you kind of put it together and you can see here, it's typically supposed to be a little bit of a more kind of slouchy, oversized kind of fit. I wasn't that big of a fan of that idea. I did want it to be a little bit longer, ideally. You'll see this kind of hits her uh, just about at her, kind of her hip, maybe a little bit of her high waist. So I knew for me I wanted it to hit about that same point, but that I was much longer in my torso than the model. But I also didn't like the look of the sleeve kind of going all the way down the arm. Um, there are some other photos of this if you look at the Project on Ravelry where it's sliding down even farther and it's this extenuated boat neck. And for me, that's not really flattering because I do have a significant bust kind of going on up top. So anything that kind of draws attention up here sometimes needs a little bit more balance and the stripes weren't gonna provide that, nor was that dolman shape. And so, and the first modification that I made is pretty obvious. I went for four colors. The one in the issue is only two. I am at the portion where I had just divided for the front. I'd worked the front and the back separately. And I had done a three needle bind off for the sleeve tops. And I'm actually really impressed with my three needle bind off here. A lot of times because I do knit through the back loop, things tend to be a muck. But I was really impressed with how kind of actually seamless that looks. Um, but I also did kind of modify the sleeves to have a little bit shorter of a sleeve cap. It was supposed to have approximately somewhere around like 14 inches of a sleeve cap. But I cut that down to closer to 12. And I'm also going to modify the neck so that instead of... And so... This, as I was kind of saying, is a really simple pattern. You can see kind of how I'm holding it at the neck markers, how it's going to kind of drape. You can also see this thing is huge. Um, the starting size was maybe a 52. I'm working the second smallest size, which is the 54. Um, and I did keep in the somewhat drastic dolman increases. Um, for my shape, they do tend to be a little bit flattering um, in looser knits like this. And you can, you can kind of see the column of them right here, creating kind of that um, triangular or almost chevron as we kind of go along. And so I've got to finish off that neck. It is, as you guys can probably clearly see, it is on these needles still. Um, yep, it's still on these needles. And then I have to, once I've done that, I have to kind of apply a little bit of a ribbing in this darker purple to the sleeves. And then this will be done. And I'm really excited to kind of wear it. It's not gonna have the same slouchy look that the pattern does, but that's what I was going for. I didn't want this overall slouchy thing just because in order for a shape like that to be flattering on me, I am a little bit short in the torso, but longer than the model. Um, and I'm much longer in the legs with most of my weight kind of in that midsection area. 
in order for something like that to be pretty flattering on me, it would have to be much longer and with much more um, rapid increases. And I really didn't want that. I was looking more to have kind of a looser tee that I can kind of wear over leggings for work or, you know, even for like just everyday fun. Nothing's wrong with that, you know, <laughs> having these kind of versatile pieces. And as I continue to fiddle with this microphone, guys, I'm a little bit sorry about that. I Maybe it's just me, but I can imagine wearing this shawl with this. Um, you know, just kind of a little bit of a more updated look. Um, it'll give a little bit more warmth since the sleeves. And actually, the, the yarn itself, being a bamboo blend, is a little bit of a cooler kind of garment. I don't know. I think this blue, this little bit maybe too contrasty, but... I am, as you guys will probably become more accustomed to as we kind of chat more frequently, I am not someone who understands good color sense. Um, and actually, this, this mug is a fabulous example of that. This is from Starbucks, and it currently has a bit of David's Tea in the Mint rooibos chocolate flavor way in it. The green, there's this, and then there is this bright, 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 bright pink in the cup. That's pretty much a wonderful example of how I pick colors. I pick what I like and not necessarily what works together. So, again, you'll become more accustomed to that over time. And you'll also see I have a pretty bold color sense. Um, while I know a lot of people tend to stick to the same color families, I don't. <laughs> I like purples, I like greens, I like blues, and I like grays, but... I also like oranges and I like reds and I like a little bit of everything in between. Um, the only thing I'm really not a big fan of are pinks, but even that you may notice in this pullover I'm wearing. This is the Sweetness Pullover by Alexis Winzo from the book Graphic Knits. You will notice in here that is clearly the color pink, so might not be a favorite, but I'm definitely open to color. My next kind of, maybe not next, maybe we'll be on the spindle sooner than later kind of project is this giant, it's not even a braid, it's just kind of a loop of fiber that I got at Rhinebeck this past year from the Sheep Shed at Mountain View. It is a merino silk blend. Um, it's, <clears throat> to say the least, it's really kind of funky. It's got these purples, it's got these reds, it's got some brown, it's got some bright, bright blue, it's got, you know, it's got a lot of the white because of the silk component. It's got a little bit of everything in here. And I've never, I've never really spun anything that has a significant silk component to it yet, or not this much silk to it. And so I'm pretty excited to see how this will spin up. Um, I tend to knot it like this for storage. Might not be the best thing, but still, I mean, I'm not going to stop doing it. So, But it has a really interesting hand to it. I feel like when I touch it, I feel more of the silk than I do the merino. And when I kind of like just pull it little tufts of it to see how it's going to spin, I feel like it's got a pretty hearty staple to it. So I'm really interested to see how thin I can go with this. But also, I'm not really sure if I just want to straight spin it like this or maybe find an interesting way to kind of break it apart. I don't really know. What do, what do you guys kind of think this would make the most sense? Maybe just straight plied or maybe, maybe it even deserves to kind of be a single of its own. I'm not really sure yet. But definitely open suggestions as this will be, this will be approaching the spindle or the wheel pretty soon. Um, I also... <clears throat> I've started it already, but I've also frogged it already. Um, I have been obsessed with the Chasing Butterfly pattern. It's a kind of looser, slouchy kind of cardigan by uh, Melanie Berg. Ever since it's come out, I'm obsessed with it. It has this beautiful jeweled rib to it. It's very textural and oversized. And I love this yarn. This is the Neighborhood Fiber Company's Studio DK in their Rock Creek Park colorway. I had purchased, uh, originally I had purchased some of this in their Rustic Fingering Base at Rhinebeck. But by the time um, the Knitting Live came around, 
I had to get this for this pattern. The Chasing Butterflies pattern had just been released, and I, I knew that I wanted it out of this yarn. And as you can kind of see, it's this beautiful kind of bright green with dark specks of beautiful kind of emerald green in there, and it's just beautiful. And as you can see, between kind of my hair and general complexion, it's a very flattering color for me. But as you can also see, it's, it's, I've got the cast on on some needles. It's not really worth showing you. It's a long cast on because what you do is you cast on provisionally across the sleeves and you work in one direction and then you work the front and then you work the other way. And it's, it's a little bit fussy like that, but yeah, I haven't got to be on the cast on. <laughs> I'm really excited for it. I just, I don't know. I'm a little bit intimidated by all that work. So we'll see. I would like to have that sweater done um, sometime in March. I am a part of the Harry Potter House Cup. And so we have monthly kind of projects that we submit. And I would like to see that be a project I submit for March classes. But <clears throat> we'll see how that goes. The last thing that I kind of have planned to go on my needles anytime soon is a weaving project, actually. I have a crooked 15-inch rigid heddle loom. And I never use it as much as I want to. I always kind of purchase it thinking I would use it as a scrap buster. I would use it for a different project. And I haven't. I can't even pretend. I think I've made a couple of different scarves and a couple of placemats. And that's pretty much been it. But <clears throat> at some point, I purchased this lace weight cone from Color Mart. And the color that it's kind of showing you guys there is pretty... It's pretty on point. It is a silverish white. And as you can see by what I'm pulling off, it is a lace weight yarn. And I had read in one of my weaving books about this idea that you can just kind of do something plain weave. And then once you have this long thing of fabric, you can pull at the weft or rather the warp fibers. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with weaving, the warp is the long things that you kind of plug into the rigid heddle and the wefts are the strands that you weave in with your hand going from right to left weft left it's a it's a kind of verbal <laughs> trick my friend Mary had taught me and I've always kind of remembered it that way but <clears throat> I saw something where you can basically do a very plain weave of this and once you have this long fabric you can pull at the warp fabrics to effectively like ruche up the fabric and I really like that idea so that's kind of been my plan and every night this week I've looked at my husband when I get home from work and I'm like oh oh we have to warp my rigid head all because for the size of our New York apartment it's definitely a two-person job <clears throat> you guys will notice I'm not showing you a warped rigid head all with my progress and instead I'm showing you a cone a cone of sad yarn that still needs to go on the rigid head all because we haven't gotten that far <clears throat> it happens um I'm hoping actually when my husband gets home in a little bit because I had to wait for him to leave so that I could do this podcast. I'm sure some of you have podcasts can relate. I'm kind of hoping we can get that work because I am really eager to get into that project. I think it's about time. It's been months upon months before I've done anything on the rigid heddle. So I'm pretty excited for that. I'm also pretty excited to take care of this thing because you guys, you've only got an idea of it in this picture, but this thing is massive. And I've been working on it a whole week. <laughs> I, I want it done. <clears throat> so that's kind of my plan. That's kind of my introduction to some of the projects I'm working on, some projects I plan to work on, um, the closest thing that I'll have to a fiber or stash acquisition for a little bit. Yeah, that's, I guess, the start of my story. And so I do really appreciate you guys joining us today for our first episode. I can be found on Ravelry and Instagram as Teenit Pearl. Um, if you ever are trying to get a hold of me, that it's probably actually the easiest way. I know a lot of people say they'll respond to email quicker or, you know, other platforms. But for me, if you're trying to get a hold of me, definitely Ravelry. And so with that, thank you for taking some time out of your busy day to maybe sit and knit a little bit with us. I'll see, hopefully see you guys next time. Bye.